This episode is powered by Safety FM. This podcast is being sponsored by SafetyConsultantBlueprint.com. In this week's episode, we are going to review the field operation manual as well as the compliance letters and directives under OSHA. So this is Demystifying OSHA Part 2. Stay tuned. Do you want to be a safety consultant? Listen to Dr. J. Allen of Safety FM give his experience after taking the Safety Consultant Blueprint course. I have actually done research on different consultants and looked at different consulting courses and so on. There is a pretty fancy, very expensive consulting course that is out there. I have actually purchased the consulting course, was interested in it. It has good information. Don't get me wrong. But you have a consulting course that really drives people on to focusing on safety and how to become a safety consultant. I will tell you on your particular course, there was better information in that particular regards than the other consulting course that was more of a generalist form. But I figured I felt like I got more information out of yours on you giving people direct path on what to do step by step. But I really think that you have a genuine good product there that can really assist people if they're interested in becoming a safety consultant. Register for the Safety Consultant Blueprint at www.safetyconsultantblueprint.com. Enter code PODCAST for a special discount. Welcome back to the Safety Consultant Podcast. I'm your host, Sheldon Primus, and I want to Thank everyone for being a part of this podcast. I hope you guys in the U.S. and those celebrating Thanksgiving that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving with your family and with your friends. And happy holidays to everybody as we're getting into the holiday season. It's just awesome. I'm a holiday guy, and this is really a fun time. So I just want to wish everybody a happy holiday season for you, whatever you're celebrating. And I want to make sure that I... I'm there with you, giving you the things you need to help you with your safety consulting business. And this one is going to be part two of Demystifying OSHA. So I just want to, uh, first, before I start, want to let you know that uh, I am opening, and it should be open already, but just in case it's not, the Safety Consultant Resource Group. So you go to Safety Consultant dot us and you could see the resource group that's there this resource group is a membership group and it's set up for those people who are ready to start their safety consulting business or they're planning to start their safety consulting business or they're in it so those three real categories of people this is a resource center for you the resource center has a bunch of forums where you could talk back and forth uh, forums for uh, just getting started, forums for you're planning to get started, forums for proposals. I've got a forums for training. So I have a lot of the courses that are available at the primus.institute. Uh, I have available in this resource group so that you could get some training. It's also a place for you to share with fellow consultants back and forth ideas to help you. I'm going to be primarily in that group. So you'll see me responding as well as uh, leading you and helping you through your journey of being a safety consultant. Part of the resources will be templates that you could use for your resources uh, for your business, especially resources and templates such as written programs, template for proposals, uh, templates and actual presentations that you could adapt for yourself and you could use these presentations for training. You can use these presentations for anything you want, as well as royalty p- royalty free pictures that I have taken that you can use for advertising and you can use those for other things. It's uh, presentations. It's always one of those things where you can't find the right picture because people don't know much about safety consulting or safety. And you just have to find that right shot to give the depiction of what you're trying to describe. That's what you're going to find at the resource center. and. It's also where other people could put their pictures in there. And it's not just a Sheldon show. It's everybody who is in the safety consulting field that wants to be part of this resource. Go ahead, join. 
go to safetyconsultant.us and you can join there, be a member, and we will work together to help you learn the business of being a safety consultant. All right, so this week, this is what I'm going to do. I'm really going to go over another section of demystifying OSHA. If you missed part one, go to last week's episode, part one. In part one, we talked about OSHA's jurisdiction. We talked about state plans versus federal plans. We talked about reading the Code of Federal Regulations and how those regulations are put into the books. We also talked about incorporation by reference and went through the definition of construction versus maintenance. So it's a really good uh, first introduction to OSHA, right? That was the baseline. So this week, what I'm going to do is let's really go through the field operation manual and also compliance directives. They are very, very important for you people that are going to be safety consultants in the U.S. The reason are is because these documents are used by the compliance officers so that they know how to regulate. So we'll start with the big boy. This is the field operation manual. It's just been updated recently. And uh, as of recent as in September of this year, 2019. So it's really fresh, new, uh, updated material in this field operation manual. So I'm going to read the purpose in the abstract. The purpose is to provide OSHA office state plan programs and federal agency with policies and procedures concerning the enforcement of occupational safety and health standards. Also, this instruction provides current information and ensures the occupational safety and health standards are enforced with uniformity. So the purpose of this document is to make sure no matter where you are, you're going to have to you're, uh, you're going to have the same uniformed experience with OSHA through the compliance side. You're going to have differences with the personalities of the con, uh, of your COSHA or compliance officers or personalities of your area and your area director, assistant directors. That's different. But the way that they enforce the rules have to be uniformed. And this is the document that does it. So... Think about that as far as the scope and the gravity of something. If you're going to be an OSHA consultant or a consultant who is based in the U.S., you're going to end up having to deal with OSHA more often than not. So you got to understand these things. So this is effectively OSHA's playbook. I don't have enough time to go through this whole document, which is 300 and let's see. It looks like it's 325 pages. So I've got it up right here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go through it as much as I can just to get you an understanding of what's in the document. But you're going to have to get a copy of this document for yourself. Download it, keep it, uh, get it printed out, go through it, highlight it, do everything that you really need to do and uh, get a good understanding of of what this is for. So how am I going to do this? I'm also going to add compliance letters and compliance directives after this too. And that's going to also give you some more information that you're going to be able to use for your business. It's going to help you really understand, especially if you're representing clients in a conference, opening conference. You go for uh, your in a formal conference is really what I mean, not opening. Opening conference is when they're doing their inspection. Yeah, you could be there for that, but chances are you may not be there for that. But the informal conference or a notice of contest, if you guys decide to go that route, then yes, you, uh, you're you going to need to understand this document. All right, so let's go through the chapters first and foremost. I'll go through the chapters, each chapter, that I'll read the heading, and then what's the important part of it. So chapter one is the purpose. The scope gives, excuse me, references, anything that's been canceled out of the document, action information, It does tell you about significant changes, backgrounds, and definitions with terminologies. That's all in Chapter 1. Chapter 2 is the program planning, and that is for area office responsibilities, OSHA cooperative programs, and that includes your voluntary protection program. It also includes your SHARP program, which is Safety and Health Achievement Recognition Program. Whew, that's a mouthful, right? And there's also a pre-SHARP program, which is before you get to the Safety and Health Achievement Recognition Program. 
strategic partnerships, alliance programs, also enforcement program scheduling, how they actually decide how they're going to go out there and do their enforcement. They do have enforcement for the U.S. Post Office that's always in there, pre-exemption by another federal agency, meaning if there is a federal agency that has jurisdiction over OSHA, uh, they do have a little guidance on that too. Home-based business work sites, they do have some inspection priorities for that. And then inspections and investigation types, that's all in that one section. Also, they have unprogrammed activities for hazard evaluation inspection scheduling. And the last of that section is going to be program inspections, which will include special emphasis programs, construction inspections, maritime inspections, national emphasis programs, local emphasis programs. And we'll talk about that. We mentioned it a little last week, but we'll talk a little bit more because the compliance level letters, they go hand in hand with these regional and local emphasis programs. Then special programs inspection scheduling, and interface with cooperative program participants. That's all six chapter two. Chapter three is the inspection procedures. So they'll have procedures on exactly what is required of the compliance officer and what they need to do to prepare and plan for inspections, the scopes of inspections, conduct in an inspection, uh, opening conference, what's expected there, what they need to do with an opening conference, review of records, the walk around, closing conference, and then special inspection procedures. That's all in chapter three. So if you're really thinking about what is required of a compliance officer or what they are going to do when they show up and knock on your door, that's truly what is going to happen. And that is their guidelines. Remember, this is the playbook. We're giving you guys the playbook. So this is it. Uh, violations is chapter four. And then after chapter four, well, actually, let's, let's go through the violation side. So chapter four is a violation, and you have the basis of a violation that's broken in each step, serious violations, and it gives you the description of what a serious violation is, the general duty clause of violations and their requirements. Also, other than serious, willful, criminal, willful, Repeat violations, de minimis violations, or citations, citing in the alternative, combining and grouping violations, that's the, how they would do that, health standard violations, violations on respiratory protection standards specifically, violations on air contaminant standards, citing improper personal hygiene practice, that's also in there, and then biological monitoring. That's all chapter four. So that's a big chapter to remember too. Chapter five is case file preparation and documents. So this is when they want to prepare their documents, getting ready for uh, either an informal conference or a notice of contest where you go in front of an administrative law judge. OSHA lawyers up, you lawyer up, you get in front of an administrative law judge and judge and that uh, judge is going to have the final rule. So here's case preparation and documentation, uh, inspection conducted, cited being issued, inspection conducted, but no citations issued, no inspection, health inspections, affirmative defenses. So that's your legal defense uh, where you have to have your burden of proof. Interview statements, paperwork and written program requirements, uh, guidelines for case file documents, uh, for use with video and audio recording, case file activity diary sheets, citations, inspection records, and that's all chapter five. Chapter six, penalties and debt collections. So it's civil penalties, the factors and the gravity that goes into penalties, uh, effects on penalties if employer immediately corrects. And I always say that if you could abate, if you could immediately correct something, do it. That's what you want to do. Peat violations, willful violations, penalties for failure to abate, violation by violation, egregious penalty policies, specific enforcement actions, penalties and citation policies for parts 1903, which is the 
inspection standard in 1904, which is the record keeping standard. Uh, failure to provide access to medical and exposure records. That's their policy on that. Criminal, criminal penalties. Handling money received by employers. Debt collection procedures. And that's all chapter six. Chapter seven. Cy, uh, contesting citations, notification of penalties and abatement dates. Informal conferences. This is their guideline for informal conference in that chapter. Petition, then uh, modification of abatements, OSHA's abatement verification regulations, abatement certifications, documentations, monitoring information for abatement periods greater than 90 days. Again, this is their policy, how to go through it. Employer failure to submit requested uh, abatement certificate, tagging for movable equipment, failure to notify employees by posting, Abatement verification for special enforcements, on-site visits, procedures for abatement verification and monitoring. Then there's monitoring inspections, notification of failure to abate, case file management, and abatement services available for employers. Chapter 8 is settlements. Goes through all the settlements of cases by area director. Gives you the things that could be corporate site settlement agreements post-contest settlements, all those things, informal conference, pre-settlement, those are all included in that chapter. Chapter 9 is complaint referral processing, and it shows you pretty much what you have to do with whistleblower complaints or what's done with whistleblower contains uh, complaints to decision trees for uh, what things go where and far as the safety and health complaints and referrals and all that. That's their guidance. Chapter 10 is industry sectors, and they break up into agriculture. Construction is reserved right now, maritime, and they don't have um, general industry per se for the sectors, uh, but you'll see agriculture, construction is reserved, maritime. Then 11, imminent danger, fatality, catastrophe, and emergency response. So those are all situational and how they do their investigation regarding those things. Chapter 12 is specialized inspection procedures for multi-employer work sites. That's reserved right now. And then temporary labor camps. So uh, whenever you see reserved, really what that's doing or saying is uh, it's a place marker, if you will. So OSHA's going to put a little place marker. And you'll see it in your CFRs too. So that little place marker is to say, we're going to put something right here. This is the logical place for it to go. So we're going to leave a heading there. Or we'll put, well, we'll leave a heading in some cases and put the word reserve, or we'll just put the word reserve. And then when we get the logical next regulation to go into that space or the guidance to go into that space, we'll put it right in. We got to, we don't have to disrupt all our number system because now we know exactly it's going to go here. So that general, that's what uh, the reserve means. Chapter 13 is federal agency field activity. So it gives you the scope of that. And it goes through some of the federal agencies and enforcements regarding to uh, military personnel, equipment, and operations, federal agency exemption from unannounced inspections, federal agencies with private sector employees on site, and then the U.S. Post Office. So that's all coming from 29 CFR Part 1960, and that's the federal agency guidance and enforcements. Federal agency inspection scheduling, so they do have targeted inspections and emphasis and complaints and everything else. Federal agency record keeping and reporting requirements are also in this chapter, so anything that deals with the federal agencies in that chapter 13. Chapter 14 is health inspection enforcement policies, and that's reserved right now. Chapter 15 is legal issues for administrative subpoenas and uh, obtaining warrants, all that stuff is going through there. Uh, notice a contest that's in there, late notice of contest that's all in there in that section, testifying and hearings and citation dates and uh, federal court enforcements, that's all in that chapter. 16 is the Freedom of Information Act, and disclosure for there is also reserved. Chapter 17 is pre-exemption for other agencies. 
So you do have a, a whole list of different agencies which may pre-exempt OSHA, meaning they have jurisdiction. So it talks about DOT, the other DOL agencies, EPA, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, all those other areas. So that is the headings, 17 chapters in the field operation manual. And the reason why I went through each one of them little by little and reading the headings is just to give you a, an idea of the gravity of this document. This is a huge document. This document's here for you to really uh, get a good understanding of what's happening with OSHA and uh, for you to help lead your clients right, lead your clients in the right way. So you should focus on a few things. So I'm not going to obviously, you know, this would be a, a four week episode if I wanted to do all this, right? So I just wanted to read you those headings so you know that you're going to have to focus on a few of these chapters. So uh, let me go back and tell you what chapters to really focus on and my my big takeaway on these chapters, all right? So first and foremost, you want to always go through chapter one because you want to get the basics, the, the understanding, the baseline of uh, the definitions, let's say, even of uh, understanding what the roles are for the organization. So do number one, read that. Chapter two is the program planning. You want to get a hold of chapter two, know that real well. Chapter three, under the inspection procedures. So I would focus really on... The conduction of inspections, that, that's on four. So all these chapters are broken down into Roman numerals. That's going to be on four. You want to know the opening conference. You want to know about how they review records. And most of this is the OSHA record keeping review. So you're going to couple that with 1904. So understand those things. Understand the procedure for walk up and walk arounds. And then the closing conference. So that's what you're going to focus on in chapter three. Chapter four, focus on the violations. What constitute a certain type of violation and then how much is this going to cost? And then chapter five is going to give you a little bit more of that. But uh, especially if you need to know the affirmative uh, def defenses, so the defense against citation, the burden of proof, that's chapter five. You want to focus in on that one. Chapter six the debt and collection penalties. You want to know that and be really aware of that because this is going to help you navigate how the citation was built up as far as pricing. And then it's going to help you to kind of uh, reverse engineer. And then you'll know exactly how much you could try to get a reduction for your clients. So you really want to get that. As, that's especially in the penalty factors in three and then the reduction factors in four. So that's a very important one to have. And then you want to know on chapter seven, the informal conference procedures. So get to know those things and uh, everything else, you know, you definitely will need to know. But if you're going to start on something, especially if you need to get caught up real quick about the field operation manual and the importance of that, I would start there. I would start with those chapters that I mentioned, all right? So that's my field operation part. The other part of this, and again, I want to do this f for you guys that are going to be OSHA compliance specialist, or at least you're going to have to represent people that have to work with OSHA. So I don't want to make this too lengthy. I want you to really kind of take this in little bite-sized pieces. That's why I broke this up into parts. And I, I, it's uh, just important and imperative that you pay attention to these details if you're going to be a successful safety consultant, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm helping you through this one. So the next thing that you're going to have to really understand and, and paying attention to details on this one is also the directives. OSHA gives directives and they do it through, and I mentioned in the last episode, we have a regulatory agenda for every agency, including OSHA. The regulatory agenda is broken down into just certain ways, certain items and things that mean a lot to the agency or to the public. There may be something that just happened, maybe a release of gas or something, and now all of a sudden process safety management is going to go top of the list and they have to deal with that. So they'll have an agenda of what the enforcement activity is going to be, but... 
the directives is to help with each and every topic that is going to be um, regulated they will have a compliance letter that is going to go even to more detail on the compliance activity so let's give you a, an example of some of these compliance letters and these are letters that are given to the actual uh, compliance officer so that they can understand their roles as well as the way that they're supposed to do these inspections so if you understand them then that means you now are also going to understand this for yourselves too and your clients so let's see there is a local emphasis program for electrical hazards in general industry this is a region 7 local emphasis program you could click on that and uh, this is uh, you could go to OSHA.gov and you want to get to directives that's really what you're looking for or you're um, under standards there's a drop down and that drop down menu will say laws and regulations so you click on that and that's really going to get you to where you're going to see the directives so once you click on the specific directives right now i'm just going to look through the the electrical directive on on general industry and this is a region 7 one so i clicked on that local emphasis program and i'm going to just this is an example of what those uh those emphasis programs look like and I've used these quite a bit. I've printed these out and I've been at dinner because I travel a lot. So sometimes I eat by myself a lot. So I'm in dinner when everyone's having fun. And here I am reading a compliance document and just highlighting it and going through and making sure that I know exactly what is required of my client. So I now could give this information out to them. So uh, that's one of the things that you're going to probably get used to doing you're gonna have to get used to printing these things out and just reading them a little bit at a time so um generally the first thing that you're gonna see when you look at these documents is you're gonna see the uh the scope and you're gonna also see uh the the requirement for whatever the uh oh i'm having a tough time downloading this one it's just not going for me uh, but you'll see the scope and then you'll see uh, who is uh, or basically the law itself. So you'll see the scope, you'll see the law, and then you'll also see uh, how it's going to be inspected. And I'll show you like a few different things with the, the inspective, uh, the inspection sides. So I would go through that and just kind of get a good, a good idea. And I'm going to try to click on another one because the electric one wasn't working before. All right. So here's one for oil and gas for Region uh, 7. And this is a local emphasis program, Kansas local emphasis program on oil and gas operations. I just clicked on that. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to see is the purpose. It gives you the scope. gives you some references of other compliance letters. Uh, any things that were canceled that uh, they don't use anymore. It's there. And then... They go, uh, this one is a short one. It's only, uh, let's see, looks like it is nine pages. And then they'll go into an executive summary. And then the table of contents is just basically uh, gives you some background, tells you what kind of in, uh, workers are in this because it gives you an NAICS code that this is under the scope. And that's the North American Industrial Classification System Code. <sighs> I hate acronyms. <laughs> it's just our industry is just like flooded with acronyms. It drives me nuts. But anyway, the NAICS code, and then that's you know North America, so it's Canada as well as Mexico and the U.S. So it gives those codes and who's uh, covered under this, and then it just goes through some background as well as inspection lists, inspection cycles, uh, program inspections, and un programmed inspections what they need to do and it, it just breaks it down that way only nine pages but it's that guidance again that's the idea is just to know that these documents are out there to guide the compliance officer and what they need to do and even if something's applicable to someone under this local or national emphasis so therefore then that means that you now get this document. You go through this document as detailed as possible. I remember going through the lockout tagout document once for a client I had in South Florida that was uh, needing me to redo their whole program. And I was like, all right, 
let's go ahead and redo the program. And then also I was going to go through and do them, you know, uh, equipment specific lockout tag out programs and uh, the trainings. I want to make sure I was doing it all right. So I went through the lockout tag out emphasis uh, compliance letter and man, I got a lot of information from there that it's, it's even more detailed uh, than the regulation because the regulation gives you the rules, but it doesn't tell you how to comply with the rules but the compliance letters do. So that's the, the key to that one. So it's, it's, it is so important. I just got to tell you, I, I, it, the, the importance of this thing is so major. That's why I am breaking it up into small groups yet again. I'm telling you this because I'm stressing the importance. And, uh, this is also information that you're going to use for other things. So I talked about first the client side, right? So let's also talk about if you are going to create a course and you want to create a comprehensive course on one of these topics, go to the compliance letter. Use the compliance letter to help you as a basis and a framework for your coursework. So now you can have a complete um, idea of the regulation, but then you could also break it up into the different headings. And that's going to tell you the chapters that you're going to have for your course. So this is going to also give you a product. So it's going to help you in both ways. So it's important to understand this stuff. All right. So um, I'm going to leave off with that. When we come back, we're going to do the tip of the week. But we're also going to have next week, I'm going to keep going with this series because we still need to talk about record keeping. We still need to talk about uh, written programs. And then we still need to talk about the importance of training and how compliance letters, excuse me, how Uh, executive orders do affect you. So we still have all those things to talk about. It's not going to be in one more week. I think it might end up being in two weeks. Uh, It depends on how deep I go into record keeping. And I want to keep these around that 30 minute mark, 35 minute mark. So I don't want to overburden you, especially. So I'm just going to keep one or two major things and we're going to focus on those. Right. So when we come back, we'll talk about the tip of the week. Enjoy some of your favorite hosts in the safety world. Enjoy shows by Sheldon Primus, Blaine J. Hoffman, Jill James, Mike Sedham, Rob Fisher, Todd Conklin, and Jay Allen. Do you feel that your knowledge would be better served if you were your own boss? Your knowledge can help more people improve their workplace safety. Most of what you know may be wasting in a job that limits what you can do for the overall health and safety of workers. Now is the time to start your own business while you're still working for your current employer. Start your own safety consultant business with the Safety Consultant Blueprint course. Get your business legal in just a week. Brand yourself as an authority in safety, even on a shoestring budget. No more stressing about how to price your services fairly, but still make a profit. And experience the amazing feeling of being your own boss. This 100% online video course is instructor-led and will give you detailed steps to keep you focused as to what to do next to grow your business. Lay out strategies to keep you maximizing your marketing and networking efforts. And explain how to get money in between clients. Register today at safetyconsultantblueprint.com and enter the code PODCAST. Welcome back to the Safety Consultant Podcast. I'm your host, Sheldon Primus, and I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. I know the last couple of weeks I've been giving you a whole bunch of stuff to really think about, especially when it comes to OSHA compliance and demystifying OSHA. Uh, For those of you that have not subscribed to this podcast, please, please, please subscribe to this podcast. Just uh, show me that you're, you're, you're getting something from it. Give me some love by hitting that little subscribe button on your whatever device or whatever podcasting service you're listening to me right now. So go ahead and show me some love. Uh, share this with a friend, share it with a colleague, share it with somebody so that they know that there is someone out there that's going to help them 
learn the business of being a safety consultant. If you're a consultant now or if you want to be one in the future, this is for you. It's for anybody that's in this field. And it's going to, I really hope that it's going to be something that you could use for your business right now. And uh, that's, that's my goal. And if you can, don't want to ask too much, but if you can, go ahead and uh, give me a review on iTunes, on whatever, uh, iHeartRadio, any of the things that you're listening to me on. And that means a lot to me. It's a good thank you. It lets me know that someone's out there listening and I'm not just, you know, talking in my home office, but someone's out there learning something and getting something from it. So I really appreciate any of your uh, reviews and that'd be a a wonderful thing for me. So thank you again. And uh, I'm going to get into the tip of the week. Okay, so the tip of week is going to be slightly different than the tips that I've always given before. Uh, This one, uh, it may be construed as self-serving, hopefully not, but I want to let you know that I go into detail on OSHA compliance in an OSHA compliance masterclass. So if you go to primus.teachable.com, primus.teachable.com, or primus.institute. The reason why I have to give you both is some people with the .institute domain, uh, they their their computer kind of freaks out on that one, right? So you can also go to primus.teachable, excuse me, yes, primus.teachable.com. And one of the courses I have there is an OSHA compliance masterclass. So though I am going through a lot of this information, I shouldn't even say a lot of this information. I'm going through some of the information that's on the class. I've got even more and it's in detail. And this masterclass is to help you if you need to know OSHA compliance, then this is to help you. So go ahead and do it. And you want to make sure that uh, you put in the code podcast for a discount. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm using this uh, tip of the week for this is because uh, the way I broke down the master classes, I did it again, little by little, step by step, but it's video. So you can actually see where to find stuff on the OSHA website. Uh, so the website has changed a little, but it's the same concept. And some of the things that I may have clicked on, you may see a different website look right now. And I don't know what OSHA's, they keep changing the website. So I can't really keep doing uh, a website uh, overview. But the search box still works. So uh, some of the things that I'm clicking on, then just go ahead and write it in as a search. And that's going to be the best way to do it. So I really want to just direct you to that course. And it is going to help you. I'm giving you some information now, but it is in such detail. And it's a video step-by-step lesson. It has the OSHA uh, just everything about the website as well as record keeping too with this class. So you're going to get a detail on that as well. So go ahead, primus.teachable.com or primus.institute and you want to look for the OSHA Masterclass. So that's the tip of the week. And I hope you have a wonderful holiday season with you and your family and just enjoy it. And I look forward to talking to you next Monday. So go out there and go get them. This podcast is being sponsored by safetyconsultantblueprint.com. This episode has been powered by Safety FM.